the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. Now, if you've been hanging around churches for a while, you've probably heard a sermon or two on this passage. And I'm betting at least one of them focused on Peter in this story. Peter, bold, impetuous Peter. Attributes we often admire, particularly if they come in the lead character of some summer blockbuster movie, you know? But in the Gospels, these qualities of Peter are as often the source of his troubles as they are of his successes. And so when he asked to come out to join Jesus in his watery walk on the waves, he quickly falters. Where did all his bold confidence go? It disappeared with a flicker of his eyes as he glanced away from his Lord and instead looked at the darkness of the water and the power of the sea. And the point of those sermons you probably heard became clear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Preachers all over the world will beat this theme like a drum. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Focus on the Lord. Keep your eyes on Jesus. The worse your troubles, the more you need to look steadfastly to the one who can save you. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't be led to doubt and fear by circumstances. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Yes, I preach that sermon too. And as drum beats go, it's, it's not a bad one. Pulsing away with its good advice, imploring us to a stronger, more trusting faith than we are often able to conjure up. And certainly there is enough here in this story to support that understanding. And yet, <laughs> you knew that was coming, right? And yet, here's my issue. It seems to me my problem isn't that I don't know I should trust Jesus and keep my eyes on Jesus. I mean, honestly, even I picked that up very early in life, and I haven't forgotten it. It's just that no matter how hard I try, I seem to get distracted, worried, even overwhelmed at times by the, the waves all around me. Economic waves, political waves, social waves, medical waves, environmental waves, ecclesial waves. That means church stuff, by the way. All of these waves rising up around me. And truthfully, I can find things to worry about just about anywhere. And while I know I should Trust them all to Jesus, put it in God's hands, 
it just isn't that easy. And honestly, having one more cheerleader tell me from the pulpit what I should do, but can't quite seem to do, that just doesn't help. If anything, it makes it worse. You know what I mean? And that's the problem, I think, with this familiar approach to this story. It confuses the gospel with good advice. And it's not that the advice isn't good. Yes, we should keep our eyes on Jesus. It's just that the thing about advice, and all the law for that matter, is that words of law can never create the righteousness they demand within us. Saying that I should do something doesn't necessarily mean that I am capable of doing it. You see, there is no creative, life-giving ability in law. You shall not steal doesn't make anyone honest. It might restrain people's lawlessness if they fear the consequences, but that's all. Which leads me to say this. On a morning like this, I have to speak. In 2001, I joined those voices who said that Muslim clerics must speak out to condemn the actions of the 9-11 terrorists or it meant they were passively supporting or enabling this behavior. As historians have reflected on 1930s Germany, Lutheran pastors and Catholic priests alike have been rightfully judged for not speaking out against the growing Nazi movement, for not stating that hatred and generating fear in others is evil, the very opposite of Jesus' life and message. It is anti-Christ. What we saw in Charlottesville was the devil on the march. The same is true now in America. The time has come to speak out, to name this evil publicly, to speak a word of law condemning racism on the march. While at the same time, and here's the challenging part, attempting to be Christ-like in our response. We cannot become violent in condemning violence. The law, whether we speak of God's law or society's laws, cannot make those white supremacists who marched in hatred this weekend into loving Christ-like people. The law is not capable of that. Society's laws can restrain the terrorist behavior, but it will not change those hearts. Only God's love can do that. And so, I pray deeply that God's Holy Spirit will stir in the hearts of those white supremacists among us to redeem them, to turn them towards God's love, to help them to see all of life with new eyes and new hearts. And I pray that God will grant wisdom to both our political and religious leaders as they seek to guide our course in the days ahead. Again, back to our text for today. The good advice of keep your eyes on Jesus will never help me keep my eyes on Jesus. It only points me in a direction a direction I already know. Which means there must be something more when it comes to this story of Peter walking on the water with Jesus. Maybe instead of emphasizing Peter's bold can-do attitude, or is it his sinking lack of faith, perhaps instead of looking at Peter, we should actually look to Jesus. Now I know, <laughs> That sounds like what I just said wasn't what we were to focus on. What I mean is 
let's look at the text. Let's, let's actually look and see what Jesus does when Peter takes his eyes off the Lord and begins to sink. It's right there in verse 31. It says, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. Picture this for a moment. They're out in the boat. It's night. And Peter sees a ghost coming toward the boat across the water. And at first he's afraid. And then he he recognizes the face and that voice coming toward them to be Jesus. And he impulsively steps out of the boat onto the waves. Can't you just imagine that, that first hesitant planting of his right foot on the water just to check and see, you know? And then he's doing it. He's standing on the water too. And, and as he watches Jesus, Peter takes a step towards him and and another, and and this is amazing. He's walking on the water just like Jesus. And then for just a fraction of a second, his eyes glance down and he sees the dark water below him. And oceans and seas always look scariest at night. And he sees the waves swelling around him and he feels a white cap crash into his knee and suddenly he drops. He's going down under the water and the boat is way behind him now. And you know the thought flashes through Peter's mind. This is how it ends? With me stupidly thinking I could walk on water? And as he's about to disappear completely beneath the waves, the strong, familiar hand of his friend Jesus grabs onto his. And Peter is being lifted back up from the cold, dark water. And then, (laughs) then he didn't need to be told to look to Jesus. Nobody had to tell him to keep his eyes on Jesus. What else could he do? I mean, he now couldn't take his eyes off of Jesus. He never wanted to take his eyes off of Jesus again. Jesus saved him. And that's the thing about the gospel, you see. It doesn't just tell you to do something. It has the power to make it possible. Sometimes it actually makes it seem impossible not to. The gospel is life-giving when heard. It creates something new in us as it is experienced. The story tells us that Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. And for Peter, that's Gospel, that's good news. And that experience of Jesus grabbing him in his moment of fear built something in Peter. Faith. And with a big grin, Jesus even teases him a little about it. You of little faith, why did you doubt? As a preacher, I firmly believe that every sermon, the people, in every sermon, the people must hear a clear proclamation of the gospel, the good news of God's saving work, or else the preacher has missed the focus of our faith. And yes, at times, all of us preachers miss the mark, all of us. And often, it takes looking at the story from another angle to get around the wall of, what we've always seen and heard and always understood in order to see things in a new way with a focus on Jesus instead of us. And in this story of Peter on and frankly in the waves, I think we can see it. Yes, Peter should have and anytime you hear the word should, you know you have a word of law 
And while law can be a good thing, it is not the ultimate thing, the life-giving thing. That is the gospel, the good news of God's love. Yes, Peter should have kept his eyes on Jesus, and so should we. But we don't always. And when we don't, when we falter, when fear overwhelms us, when we totally fall on our faces, Jesus is there to catch us, to hold us, to support us and stand us up straight again, ready to give life another go. You see, Jesus isn't simply our life coach. He's our savior. The one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Too much of American Christianity, I think, has forgotten that. Reducing the gospel to one more spiritual self-help recipe. But the Lord, the one who walks on the waters, not only directs wind and wave, but also death and life as he overcomes it. And this Jesus wants more than to command our attention. He wants to save our lives, to, to catch us when we fail, to hold us with his strength and set us on our feet again, to, to fill us with new hope. And he's promised to do just exactly that. So yes, keep your eyes on Jesus. And while you're doing it, Notice that he is there for you, with you, with his strength to catch you when, like me, you get distracted by the waves and your fears overwhelm you and your steps falter. He's there. He's got you. And he never lets go. And that is the gospel the good news, the best news, and to God be the glory. Amen.